Hello, this is Robin Walker. I'm the Black History Man. This is Cush Community, and class is in session. Cush Community is brought to you by our amazing sponsor, The Black Secret. Are you ready to dive deep into black history, economics, wealth building and self-empowerment? The Black Secret is offering exclusive courses by none other than the black history man himself, Robin Walker. This is the most powerful black studies course, an offer for the entire black world. And guess what? You can get started today by simply using our special link, which you can find in the video description. Be sure to apply our coupon code KIMBUNGA to get another 20% off your membership. And there's more! Want to get a taste of what The Black Secret has to offer? You can also claim the book 100 Black History Facts absolutely free! Link in the description. So what are you waiting for? Expand your mind, unlock a world of knowledge, claim your free book and let The Black Secret guide you on a journey of discovery and empowerment. Click on the link below or subscribe to get more information. Class is in session. Greetings, the presentation is called The West African Empire of Ghana. All right, let's get straight into it. There was a Timbuktu manuscript written by a Timbuktu professor called Mahmoud Kati, and the manuscript's name was Tariq El Fatash. And apparently that translates as Chronicle for the Seeker, meaning Chronicle for the Seeker of Truth. And what Mahmoud Kati did was he divided West African ancient history into the rise and fall of three empires. He started with the Songhai Empire, which comes last. Then he mentions the Mali Empire, which is before it. And then the first one is the Ghana Empire. So if we switch the order around, Ghana comes first, Mali comes second, the Songhai Empire comes third. And the reason why he did that is these three empires are roughly in the same place. They roughly have the same cities, they roughly have the same heritage. And the real differences between Ghana, Mali and Songhai is which language became the ruling language of the empire. The Ghana period, the ruling language was called Soninke. The Mali period, the ruling language was called Mandinga. And in the Songhai period, the ruling language was Songhai. Apart from that, it's the same place except obviously Mali was bigger than Ghana and Songhai was bigger than Mali. They'd taken over even bigger chunks of West Africa. Now let me give you an excerpt from the Tariq El Fatash. He recorded that the rulers of Ghana, they were known as the Kayamaga dynasty. From the seventh century, they were in power and this was their typical night ritual. The Kayamaga came out every night after nightfall to spend discussing with his subjects, but he only leaves his palace only after they assembled 1,000 logs in front of the doors of the palace under which they set fire. That light produced by the fire lit the space between the sky and the earth, bringing light to the whole city. And then after that, the prince would come out and install himself over a platform of red gold. So this idea then of living large, this platform of red gold, this idea of the king being a mighty, uh, impressive figure that comes out doing this night ritual is one of the things recorded by Mahmoud Kati. But it has to be said the Timbuktu chroniclers are very sparse on ancient Ghana. And I'll tell you why. One of the reasons is religious bigotry. You see, a lot of the Timbuktu scholars were African Muslims, and they took attitude towards African traditionalists, people following traditional African religions. And so they big up the Muslims, and they shrink the achievements of the non-Muslims. 
And the result of that then is because ancient Ghana was largely non-Islamic, they shrink what they have to say about ancient Ghana. So we have to then look to other sources to fill in the gaps that we have. And with ancient Ghana, the gaps really are huge. So what we know is scant, but it's still powerful. And so what I'm going to do is to introduce the scant pieces of information that we know, but you're going to see it's powerful. Okay, now, one of our sources of information is archaeology. If you don't have documents, what has been dug up? And an ancient Ghanaian city called Old Gene has been much excavated. Now, when we deal with excavations, we're interested in what products have been dug out of the ground. And a lot of people find products boring to talk about. Most people would rather talk about people than products. But products tell you about trade. They tell you the trading networks. And we know that Old Gene was the first center of trade in West Africa. Because of the archaeology that's been dug up, they found foodstuffs, they found metal products, they found gold. And among the artifacts were these copper pieces of jewellery that were dug up. And these are around uh, 9th and 10th centuries, somewhere between 800 and 1000 AD. And you can see that they are exquisite. Another important thing that was dug up is this beautiful earring which is of gold, and this is 9th century, and you can see the other golden decorations. Uh, and we've got someone wearing it, so you can see how it would have looked um, uh, on someone in situ. Kumbisale becomes the second center of trade in West Africa. And this was also the capital city of ancient Ghana, which then becomes, as Ghana spreads over West Africa, the capital city of an empire. There were camel caravans, especially in the north, bringing salt into Kumbisale. There were donkey caravans, especially in the south, bringing gold into Kumbisale. There were barges moving goods along the two waterways. One waterway was the Senegal River, another waterway was the Niger River. Then you had headporters bringing goods from the far south. They would put their goods on their heads and they would move with those goods. So what were the products? The goods included metal products. They included cotton cloth. They included Morocco leather. Now, the metal products, one of the things that was excavated was a pair of scissors. Cotton cloth, that tells us what people were wearing. Morocco leather, that's your boots and shoes. But Morocco leather doesn't mean the Moroccans made it. This is what the Europeans called West African products because they assumed when it comes from Morocco, it must be Moroccan. Not necessarily. A lot of that stuff was actually uh, made elsewhere in Western Central Africa and was sold into Morocco. And therefore boots, shoes, bookcases, leather pillowcases, many things that people think of as Morocco leather is actually West African products. And then what's happened at Kumbisale is the rulers imposed import and export taxes on the products coming in and the products coming out. And Kumbisale becomes a rich and powerful city. Our next chapter is the Arab Jihad against North Africa between 639 and 708 AD. Um, the word Jihad has multiple meanings, one of which is personal struggle, such as your struggle to get yourself off drugs, that's your Jihad. Other uses of the word Jihad is war. And what happened was the Arabs conquered North Africa in a Jihad between 639 and 708 AD. And this is why North Africa today is Arab, because if we go back in the day, North Africans used to be black, just like the rest of Africa. But let's read what happened. Um, a scholar called Ibn Khaldun, 
explained what happened. At the time of the conquest of Northern Africa, and I've put in brackets by the Arabs, some merchants penetrated into the western part of the land of the blacks and found no king more powerful than the king of Ghana. His states extended westwards to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Kumbisale, the capital of this strong, populous nation, was made up of two towns and formed one of the greatest and best populated cities in the world. The author of the Book of Roger makes special mention of it, as does the author of Roads and Kingdoms. So what have we just been told? When the Arabs conquered North Africa, they tried something in West Africa. But whatever they tried, they were stopped by this most powerful West African king, who presumably handed out a smackdown. That king was the ruler of Ghana, and his territories were all the way from the Atlantic Ocean inland. And his capital city was one of the greatest and best populated cities in the world. And if we want to know more about ancient Ghana, we should read this book, the Book of Roger, and we should read another book, The Roads and Kingdoms. We're going to follow up on both of those books. Now, the Arabs in Africa brought in Islam, and Islam became a rival for traditional African religions. And it divided Africans then, and it divides Africans today. Should we stick with tradition, or should we jump on Islam? You also had um, Africa's first major refugee problems, because the early North Africans that used to live in Egypt don't. The ones that used to live in Libya don't. The ones that used to live in what is today Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, they don't. They move south. And this is why black people in Africa live south of the Sahara. Um, an African queen from Mauritania called Dahia El Kahina tried to stop the Arab invasions. And she was brave and she fought back. But ultimately, she was killed in battle and the Arabs conquered North Africa. We also have Islamic sources of African history. So it's not just archaeology. And it's, just, and it's not just late Timbuktu traditions writing about what happened hundreds of years earlier. So we have Ibn Fazari writing in 773 AD. We have Ibn Hawqal, the Surat el-Ard, 951 AD. We have el Bekri, the Book of the Roads and Kingdoms, writing in 1067. That's one of the books that Ibn Khaldun told us that we should read. And we have El Idrisi's The Book of Roger, 1153 AD, which again is one of the books that uh, Ibn Khaldun told us that we should read. All right, so what do those sources tell us? Ibn Fazari, 773 AD, is the first person that mentioned the name Ghana and his book has survived. And he tells us that Ghana was very rich in gold and it was an empire the same size as the Idris' state in Morocco. Then we have Ibn Hawqal, El Bekri, and El Idrisi. I'm going to tell you what they had to say. In the case of Ibn Hawqal, he wrote Surat el Ard, 951 AD. And one of the topic areas he wrote about were relations between the city state of Aldergast which in those days was slightly outside, right on the periphery of ancient Ghana, and the city relationship with the kings of Ghana and the kings of some next place called Kuga. Let's read it. The king of Aldegast maintains relations with the king of Ghana. The ruler of Ghana is the richest king on the face of the earth by reason of the wealth and treasure of nuggets dug up in the past by his predecessors and by himself. He exchanges presents with the ruler of Kuga, whose wealth and prosperity is nothing like that enjoyed by the ruler of Ghana. All right, let's do some analysis of what Ibn Hawqal has told us. The ruler of Ghana was the richest king on the face of the earth. And that means that by this period, 951 AD, 
West Africa is the center of where it's at in terms of economic activity on the earth. West Africa is where it's at. This is where the activity is happening. This is the centerpiece of the world in terms of what's going on. He also mentioned, same scholar Ibn Halkal, mentioned witnessing a merchant write a second merchant a check for 42,000 golden dinars. And this has caused consternation among scholars. What do you mean check? And the word sack, S-A-K-K, is how you would transliterate it into a Roman alphabet. That means check. That is the word for check. And so a lot of scholars uh, have a hard time getting around that, but that's what's in Ibn Halkal's document. West Africans were writing each other checks by at least that period. By the way, here's an image of a golden um, pectoral that was buried not with the ruler of Ghana, but one of his underlings. This was buried with one of his underlings. And as you can see, it's very, very impressive. All right, now the court of Emperor Tenkamenin of Ghana was described by El Bekri in the book, The Book of the Roads and Kingdoms, one of the books that we've been told we should look at. The book was published in 1067, and it paints a picture of what was going on in Ghana roughly the same time as 1066 in Britain. So we've got something to compare. Let's read it. When he gives audience to his people, he sits in a pavilion around which stand his horses caparisoned in cloth of gold. Behind him stand ten pages holding shields and gold-mounted swords. And on his right hand are the sons of the princes of his empire, splendidly clad and with gold plaited into their hair. The governor of the city is seated on the ground in front of the king, and all around him are his ministers in the same position. The gate of the chamber is guarded by dogs of an excellent breed, who never leave the king's seat. They wear collars of gold and silver. All right, let's do some analysis. Now, the first thing we need to draw attention to is what were the animals wearing? Forget what the people were wearing. What were the animals wearing? Well, you've got dogs wearing collars of gold and silver. You've got horses with cloth over them with gold stitched through it. That's how the animals are stepping. And then when we deal with the people, they are literally dripping in gold. They've got gold plastered into their hair gold-mounted swords, and so on. A picture of absolutely stupendous wealth. Now, if we compare England at the time of the Battle of Hastings, it's not representing, it just really isn't. Right now, we have a picture of the city of Kumbi Saleh from the 11th century, from this geography book, the Book of the Roads and Kingdoms. We now know why the capital was a twin city. One part of the city was where the ancestralist traditional religion was practiced. They worshipped a deity called Wagadu Bida, which is presented in the imagery as a snake. And that's not unusual. Ra in ancient Egypt, the, the uh, image of Ra is as a coiled snake. And snakes are very, very important in many, many religions, including Judaism, including Christianity. And then we have the uh, Islamic religion, which was then the new religion. And so if you were an African Muslim, or if you were a, a foreigner and Islamic, you will live in the Muslim part of town. And if you were a traditionalist, you were in the, you know, the ancestralist part of town. Now the ancestral town had a castle, domed buildings, a royal court of justice, and a mosque. Again, we're taking all of this from El Bekri's uh, account. The Muslim town had 12 mosques, schools, and centers of learning. Now, the centers of learning can't be schools because I've just said schools. So it must be schools, centers of learning, presumably madrasas, or possibly even universities for all we know. Um, there were 10 miles of suburbs. The archeologists found that the two towns were 10 miles apart, and in the suburbs, says El Bekri, were houses of stone with beams of acacia wood. 
And if you have one town, another town, 10 miles of suburbs, if you draw a line around the entire city, it would have been huge. And so when Ibn Khaldun said Kumbi Saleh was one of the greatest and best populated cities in the world, he wasn't kidding. Now, the residence of the emperor in 1116 AD was also a castle. Now, is this the same building that we've just described, or is this a new building? Don't know. But in the Book of Roger, written by Elidrisi, we read that the, the Ghanaian emperor's residence was a well-built castle, thoroughly fortified, decorated inside with sculptures and pictures, and having glass windows. Now the glass windows is again one of those things where scholars have gone into consternation to try and say why it's not true. It is true, that's what's in the document. Glass windows. And so West Africans were on glass windows from at least the year 1116. And I've seen other evidence of glass windows in not just in West Africa, but in East Africa as well. Now, how did the empire of Ghana fall? Well, there was a movement of propaganda which began in the deserts to the north and then spread to the Senegal region to the west. And that movement of propaganda was known as the Almoravids. And the Almoravids were fanatical Muslims. And they had this idea that as Muslims, they should not be ruled by an emperor that was a traditionalist. So they moved to overthrow that emperor and break the Senegal region away from ancient Ghana. And they succeeded in causing a lot of chaos. And so the stability of the empire started to wobble when the Almoravids led their campaign somewhere around 1076 AD. Um, when the Almoravids were able to take over, a lot of the traditionalists said, well, I don't see why we should be ruled by Islam, and they started to leave the empire. And so there was a migration of the Akan-speaking peoples, and they are thought to have migrated from ancient Ghana to where modern Ghana is today. Again, we don't know this for a fact. This is what scholars think happened. We also get the Islamicization of the ruling class, where ancient Ghana, after this period, the Quran becomes the law book. And so Sharia becomes the, the way things are done. Um, and what then happens is, is what's known as the uh, Maliki school of Islam starts to dominate, as it dominates West Africa ever since. We also get one of the territories that ancient Ghana used to rule. Ancient Ghana used to rule this backwater called Mali. But the Malians break away under a ruler called Sunjiata Keita. And Sunjiata Keita not only breaks away, he wages war on what the remnants of ancient Ghana and he seizes the capital city of ancient Ghana in the year 1240 AD and destroys that city. That city now becomes smoking ruins. So the time period then where ancient Ghana collapses is 1240 AD. So the period of ancient Ghana is 300 AD, is where we get the first kings. 700 AD is when it becomes an empire ruling nearly half of West Africa. 1240 is when it collapses. And then there's a prehistory going way back even before 300 AD. All right, now the archaeologists found Kumbi Sale, the capital city, and they excavated it. And let me read uh, from Monsieur Denis Pierre de Pedral. The book is called The Archaeology of Black Africa. And I'm going to read what the archaeologists found when they excavated Kumbi Sale. We can still distinguish clearly the outline of an avenue bordered by houses with walls more than one meter or one and a half meters above ground. The roofs have collapsed. Farther on, a strip of flat ground for a public square with walls which seem to have once supported upper floors. 
Sometimes the buildings are so well preserved that little would be needed to make them livable again. The other constructions are more complicated. One consists of five rooms, four meters deep, with communicating halls. The masonry is perfect. The walls are 30 centimeters thick. So we have fine quality masonry, buildings above ground going up more than one story, and buildings below ground going down again more than one story. So we've got multi-story buildings with the staircases and that kind of thing with perfect masonry. Okay, now during this period, we get the beginnings of a style of architecture in West Africa called Western Sudanic. And the finest example of this is a building in Gene, which began life in the 11th century as a palace. This same building became a mosque in the year 1204 AD. And this is West Africa's most uh, uh, celebrated building. Documentaries have been made about it, books have been made about it. The building is made entirely of clay bricks, or if you want to diss it, mud. And it's, it looks like an overgrown sand castle, but it is actually one of the grand pieces of uh, West African architecture and one of the distinguished contributions to world architecture. Let's look at another picture where we can see inside the buildings, we can see the columns and the pointed arches. And for the modern nation of Mali, it's heritage. So this monument, now called the Great Mosque of Gene, appears on stamps. It appears on the money. And there is a mock-up reconstruction of it, which I saw personally in Bamako, which is in the capital city of uh, Mali today. So, final word. While we are still in ignorance of our history, this is what others are doing with our heritage. Did you know there's a mock-up of this palace, which is now the Grand Mosque of Gene? There's a mock-up of it in France where it's called the Missiri Mosque in Fréjus, France, which was built in 1930. There's another mock-up of this building uh, called the Timbuktu Theatre, which is in Bush Gardens, Tampa Bay, Florida, in other words, Disneyland, and that was built in 2004. There's a third mock-up of this building, known as the Crocodile Park in Torremolinos in Spain, and finally, there's a mock-up of this building known as the Museum of African Art in Jeju-do, South Korea, which means South Koreans know our history and heritage and are able to build in the architectural style of our ancestors. And that concludes our presentation, the West African Empire of Ghana. Kush Community is brought to you by our amazing sponsor, the Black Secret. Are you ready to dive deep into Black history, economics, wealth building and self-empowerment? The Black Secret is offering exclusive courses by none other than the Black history man himself, Robin Walker. This is the most powerful Black Studies course, an offer for the entire Black world. And guess what? You can get started today by simply using our special link, which you can find in the video description. Be sure to apply our coupon code KIMBUNGA to get another 20% off your membership. And there's more! Want to get a taste of what The Black Secret has to offer? You can also claim the book 100 Black History Facts absolutely free! Link in the description. So what are you waiting for? Expand your mind, unlock a world of knowledge, claim your free book and let The Black Secret guide you on a journey of discovery and empowerment. Click on the link below or subscribe to get more information. Class is in session.